How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, today I'm finally COVID negative. So I don't know what that's going to change about the show here today. Probably nothing. Maybe I'll be in a better mood, but I can't guarantee anything. But hey, we got a lot to talk about here on Friday. Not the least of which is an update on Cody Rhodes. Yesterday, successful surgery to repair his torn right pectoral. No word on when he's going to be back in action, but uh, presumably it would be somewhere in the range of six months from now, maybe right around Royal Rumble time, in fact. So we'll tell you about that here today. And uh, Bruce Pritchard will also be undergoing surgery as well. We got uh, SmackDown coming up tonight, and uh, four things announced so far, including Bunny the Bank qualifying matches with the women, one of whom happens to be, according to WWE.com, Lacey Evans. So we'll find out if she uh, actually ends up uh, wrestling tonight. It's been Her return has been teased on multiple shows for multiple weeks, but allegedly it's her and Xia Li tonight. Give me the rest of the lineup. We've got the Dynamite ratings for Wednesday. Audience was down, but number one on cable. Well, let's talk about the uh, New Japan show coming up this weekend. Dominion is coming up. We've got the stipulations for the KOPW 2022 title match. We'll tell you about that one. And uh, Vince McMahon allegedly working on an autobiography. Can you imagine the story of Vince McMahon and WWE as told by Vince McMahon and WWE? That should be something. Anyway, back in a moment to kick off the show. Mike Semper, Vivi joins us. Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, Vivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. Carrie Morton will be joining us in the final segment of the show here today. <laughs> yes. Yes. The son His dad of, beat you up. Son of Ricky Morton, who once beat my ass in a match. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk to him about his father, his own career, the NWA show coming up this weekend, lots of stuff to get into. That's the final segment of the show here. But first, all of the news. Cody Rhodes undergone successful surgery to repair his torn right pec. Former AEW Chief Brandy Officer Brandy Rhodes, his wife, made the announcement on social media Thursday. Surgery was deemed a success and that Cody is on the road to recovery. Suffered a torn pec while weight training last week. Which, by the way, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, apparently WWE put up a video. Cody training for Hell in a Cell. Is it him in the weight room? I don't think it includes when he tore his pec, but uh, what a thing to put up after this poor guy tore his pec working out. Performed at Hell in a Cell, defeating Rollins in the main event of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. And then they shot the angle the next night where Rollins attacks Rhodes with a sledgehammer. No timetable has been uh, stated as to expected a return to action, but uh, very sports medicine sources indicate six to nine months as a general guideline. So most likely return at the Royal Rumble. Who knows? If it were me, I'd want to return at Elimination Chamber. You know, at least amount of time between the return and WrestleMania, the better. Well, you never know what they might what they might decide to do. But anyway, best of luck to Cody. Hopefully he uh, returns returns sooner rather than later. And apparently five have... stars in the Observer. Is that right? Uh, that's, uh, I guess, with people being angry about things. I guess. Uh, with Dave trending, I assume that's probably what it was, yes. Well, is that day one event still in match. Atlanta? Are they going to do that thing again? I believe day one is in Atlanta, so that would also be a... Uh... Day one of the big return. Uh, yes, Rhodes. The, Rhodes the Recovery. You mean the day one show that's not actually going to be on day one this year? Well. Let's find out what day it's actually going to be on. They should do it on day one every year. They should do that. Makes sense. Actually, you know Peacock, what? They could. You know what? Day one What's this that? year is, in fact, Sunday. So they can do the pay-per-view on day one this year. There you go. Yeah. Now, I think in, in 2024, that gets all weird. Yeah, Why? Tw- 2024, day one is uh, Monday. 
I don't think they're going to do the day one pay-per-view on day one. And, then, of course, oh, well. the year after that, day one will be on Tuesday. And I don't think no. they're going to do the day one pay-per-view on Tuesday. Very easily. You could you could merge day one into Raw. It's a special day one Raw. Oh, get out of and here. And then the next year. No, it makes sense. Look, they are a content farm, are they not? They so are, but it's a pay-per-view. They're going to do day one on, like, day five next week. So when it becomes Tuesday, then you just do it on Peacock, and it's just something you throw up there. I mean, come on. Do you really, like— Why don't they call it WWE New Year and just have it on in the first Saturday in the new year? <laughs> WWE first Saturday of the new year. That's what they That's should what call they should the pay-per-view. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. WWE first Saturday of the new year. Only on Peacock. Field for this year's Money in the Bank ladder match will begin to take shape on SmackDown Friday. Two Money in the Bank qualifiers will take place on SmackDown, they claim. Drew McIntyre versus Sheamus in a men's qualifier, and Lacey Evans versus Zia Lee. Last yeah. I checked, Zia Lee was a heel, so mm-hmm. I think Lacey will be a uh, baby face, but God only knows. And Vince McMahon. They're the only ones that know for sure. We've also got uh, Ricochet will defend the Intercontinental title against Gunter. Oh, boy. And Not Max. Good, Ricochet. Max Dupree will reveal his first client for Max maximum Dupree. male models. Ah, uh, yes. Who do you think it'll be? Well, it ain't going to be Face, <laughs> but it might be Mace. That I can tell you. It's so funny. Uh, nothing. How out of his mind Filthy Tom is over a guy misspeaking. <laughs> his name ain't Face. And, bro... You know what's funny about that Filthy Tom show? Yes. A lot, actually. He waited a week. (laughs) He's like Christian with Jungle Boy. This guy waited a week. Actually, basically two weeks, because we didn't do a show the week I got back from uh, Vegas. Mm -hmm. This guy waited over a week to get on my case about not knowing what steak frites are, because I said frites. God forbid I pronounce a word wrong. He waited a week. To get on me about that. So you know what's going to happen when Maximum Male Models introduces the first client tonight? Yes. And this bloke isn't called Face? Mm-hmm. Don't think I ain't going to get my revenge on Monday's show. He also didn't know the nationality of his wife. You don't know anything about Oh, get partners. out of here with that. You know nothing get about Get out partners. of there with that. She was Zero. Polish literally until he needed her to be French. Born Don't even raised, get Ryan. me started. Just saying. Just saying. You know nothing about your partners. No, That's I know I know a lot. Everything. That's why he irritates me. New Japan has revealed the stipulation for the King of Pro Wrestling 2022 match at Sunday's Dominion event. Promotion is announced that after two days of voting in the New Japan and New Japan Global Twitter account. The match will be held... Under title holder Shingo Takagi's proposed 10-minute scramble rules. Jesus. The wrestler with the highest total count on their pinfall attempts at the end of 10 minutes will be declared the winner. (laughs) Taichi proposed a limited finishers total 10-count match where only certain pin attempts would be allowed, and the first wrestler to reach a total of 10 on their pinfall counts would win. Who put this together? Tony Khan? Could we have more details? The dirt worst. You know what's... Yeah, Yano was involved. It might be worse, actually. It really could be. Dave was uh, on one of the shows, and he was talking about the uh, that 30-count match or whatever they had, the first person yeah. to get to 31 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And Cumulative he, count. He goes... Uh, and by the way, everybody, yeah, uh, Tony Khan was Booker of the Year two years in a row. So... Don't act like he sucks at booking. Yeah, he ain't Bill Watts. So, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, they had that 30-count match. And Dave goes, it sucked. And he says something like, you know, I like the idea of coming up with uh, with new things that have never been seen before in wrestling. <laughs> yes. And I was like, bro, I love you and all, but, like, it's been 140 years or more that there's been pro wrestling in this country and in this world. And if you haven't seen a type of match by 2022, probably a reason for it. 
it probably sucks. Right? I hate this game I mean, for dude, a wrestling title. Took, I hate everything about it. I hate all the stipulations they're adding to it. All that nonsense. It hate took it. till t- 2006 for some idiot to come up with the idea of a battle royal well. where you had to race to get into the ring. <laughs> a reverse battle royal. <laughs> Thank Gee, you, I wonder why in 130 years nobody came up with that idea before. Because it's stupid. Uh, and then it was redone again. Because everything in wrestling happens again, no matter how stupid it is. Somebody will take it and think, hey, I can do something with that. And usually, no, no, you can't. Bro, it is sound logic. This guy says that's not sound. Actually, it is. What, listen, what? listen. If you haven't come up with an idea for a match in 140 years, okay? Yeah, every now and then somebody's going to hit on something. And it's like, you know what? No one's ever done that, but that actually, that was pretty cool. That's one in ten ideas, okay? Nine of them are going to be horrible ideas. Of course you can come up with something, but, like, the vast majority of good ideas after 140 years have been done in wrestling, okay? And at this point, everything is a variation of of things that have worked so far. Every now and then somebody's going to hit on something, but in general, nine of the ten ideas are going to be a reverse battle royal. It's a stupid idea. It doesn't make any sense. There's a reason nobody ever did it. The hard ten tournament? God. <laughs> this guy deserves an award for coming up with so many stupid ideas. It's actually <laughs> impressive when you think about it. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back at the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sembervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. An autobiography from WWE Chairman Vince McMahon is currently in the works. New York Post, page 6, reported Thursday, McMahon is, quote, shopping a memoir to publishers this week. Source told page 6 the book is, quote, essentially Vince's memoir about building WWE. The source adds that a deal could be imminent, explaining there have been other bios on him in WWE in the past, but this is very much his memoir Told in his voice about his rise and life. Associates didn't return page six's, what was that, requests. Skype close there? What you got going uh, on? I think that's old Carrie. Anyway, they said that uh, there have been other bios. Seemingly a very hush-hush project, it says. Does it say who's writing it for him? Dave Meltzer wrote about the auto. It's an autobiography. So what? In uh, this week's Observer Newsletter, he you wrote, know, You know better. Representatives of Vince McMahon are shopping to the major book companies. I give an autobiography of Vince to talk about how he built the WWE. The New York Post reported on it this week, saying that everyone has been mum in trying to keep it a secret. This would attempt to go head to head with the Abraham Reisman book, Ringmaster, that Simon and Schuster is putting out early next year. That's the book project they first asked me about. That book that Reisman has been working on since 2020 didn't include any help from WWE or McMahon, but just about everyone else talked with him about it. So there you go. Vince's autobiography. Please put that down on my Amazon wish list. I totally didn't buy the company with the company's own money. I totally didn't do that. Built it all myself. Pulled a lot of wrestling out of smoke-filled arenas. Confrontation between an AEW wrestler and a WWE wrestler took place at a hotel last month. In the latest Observer, Dave Meltzer reports Chris Jericho and MVP got into a confrontation following the May 18th episode of Dynamite in Houston. Though it was a tense situation, Meltzer notes nothing bad ended up happening. He says, after the 518 show in Houston, there was a confrontation in the hotel the wrestlers were staying at between Chris Jericho and MVP at about 1 a.m. after the Dynamite tapings. Something that I'm not clear of happened 18 months ago where they had a falling out. Jericho was talking to Matt Hardy. MVP showed up. Most people don't know, didn't know what was up and thought he was kidding around until it became clear he was not kidding. Nothing bad happened, even though it was a tense situation. Jericho did tell him he doesn't fight jobbers when he got in the elevator and MVP was screaming about it in the lobby. How animated do you think Jericho was telling Dave that story when you guys were in Vegas? Jericho told the story when we were in Vegas? I don't know. Just just say he did. 
I mean, I bet you he was probably ecstatic. I don't think he did, because I was with Dave most of the time in Vegas, and we did not hear this story from Chris Jericho. Sounds like a story. I don't know. It sounds like this probably may have come from Jericho's side right down to, as he jumped in the elevator, his MVP was flailing his arms, screaming, and we don't know exactly what the situation was about. As the elevator doors closed, Jericho says, and I don't fight jobbers, and he goes back. Bro, it happened at the Wrestler's (laughs) Hotel with all the wrestlers there. Didn't happen in a in a uh, whatever. Oh my! Well, it'd be interesting to see what it was about. Lots of different uh, people. Uh, Here's a real question: suggesting what it was about. What is Jericho's this damn Twitter? grown man MVP doing trying to start a fight with somebody in a hotel at one a.m.? Oh, go listen to this, brother! Come on, get out of here! <laughs> come you on, uh, this is one side we haven't heard MVP side, have we? Have we heard MVP side? Have we heard him say, I just went down to talk to him and, you know, again, we are hearing one side of this story. There tends to usually be three in, in this type of case. I'd like to hear There's more. There's multiple witnesses, dude. Okay. I haven't seen a witness step forward and go that Jericho started this. Okay, okay. MVP decided he wanted to start a fight. How old is this guy? I'm going to mm. find out. How old is MVP? Maybe, well, you know. According to Wikipedia, still in middle school. Well, maybe he just wanted to storm the Capitol. I wonder if he uh, told Jericho his dad could beat up Jericho's dad. Because I doubt he could, by the way. I don't know about that. We we don't know. I I know if if it came down to MVP and Chris Jericho, who I'm putting my money on. Maybe MVP can... uh, I'll put it on P. And do a rap about it. (laughs) Wait, you're going to put your money on MVP over Jericho? Yes! Okay, hold on. Two of these, there's two men here. Yes. One of them has had multiple altercations in this business, and uh, including guillotining Goldberg. Yeah. The other has zero known altercations. But is uh, you by your own admission, jujitsu is a pretty you know healthy weapon. To yeah, have. but he's and got one leg. MVP's got that. I mean, MVP's in. in Are the we jiu-jitsu. really talking about who would win a real fight between these two guys? I, I don't know. One, somebody's on. been in the pen. Forty-eight years old. I don't know. MVP's picking fights in a hotel. Hey, this is the news that's in the Observer. I mean, right? This is what Leadstar is talking about, this sort of thing. It's a story. It's on the front page of the, the website, right? Bruce Pritchard will be having surgery to repair a torn rotator cuff. <laughs> now is this news? Something to reth- wrestle with podcast. Pritchard said, <laughs> I have a torn rotator cuff. The plan is to get it fixed next Wednesday. Six months of rehab. I had colitis. I changed my diet. I started working out. I started getting healthy and started feeling good. Actually, I put on weight because I've been working out. I'm getting stronger. And all this good ass feeling really good. But my shoulder was bugging me, so I was going in for treatments for my shoulder. He was unaware of the injury until his arm was bruised. Then one day I looked in the mirror. My entire right arm is just black and blue. The ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life. I said, what is this? It didn't hurt. As a matter of fact, my shoulder pain had gone away. So I went to the doctor. I said, hey, what's this bruising from? They looked at it and said, you tore your bicep clean off the bone from the shoulder. Well, how did I do that? He said. Anyway, no, no, no. You know, it'll be interesting one of these days is to, uh, I don't know if Cody would ever really admit this or not. And uh, I do not want to come here on the air and say that Cody was in no pain. But uh, Bruce Pritchard here tore tore his, uh, his deal off the bone and he didn't have any pain. And, uh, you know, I wonder how much of, of Cody, obviously, one would presume that there was some pain involved, but, you know, I wonder how much of it was uh, being a pro wrestler when he was in that match on uh, mm-hmm. on Sunday. Did you ever hurt your rotator cuff patting yourself on the back after one of your matches? Never, because I don't Never? do that, Mike. Mm. I don't need to pat myself on the back. No, no. Just no. bury your partners after you lose. Like who? Filthy. Tom. Yes. Wow. I like Who else Tom. have you teamed with in the past? Tom's a good guy. Colonel De Beers. I never teamed with Colonel De Beers. Well, was he <laughs> Colonel still, uh, De Beers? Was he still active up there? What was it? Easy Ed. I Ed trained Wyskowski? with the Colonel at Buddy okay. Rose's school, <laughs> but I never teamed with him. What a guy! <laughs> That's the random character he was. I, you know, so much of his earlier stuff seems to be dribbling out because of the WWF. The short time he spent there when Buddy Rose was there, he came over as well too for a little while. But his run as Colonel De Beers, and then his characters outside of that, including I guess what he was in real life, <laughs> it's just wild, absolutely wild. 
I'm pretty sure I still get uh, emails from the colonel. I have to go back and see when the last one was. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Well, January uh, 24 was the most recent one. Is he cussing you out like Lance would? Nah, he's one of those guys that just like forward stuff all the time. Like, oh, whatever yeah. goes into his inbox. Yes. <laughs> Usually political. <laughs> he's like your your personal Facebook stream right in your email, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I don't, I don't see a lot of them. Uh, all right, what do we got in the uh, the bin here? Hopefully something. Why? We're really at the bottom of it, so. Not really. I got, I, got, uh, I got Kerry Morton coming on. We do, but we also have three more minutes. I have to, to decide if I want to be polite about his dad or not. Well, you you might want to be. He might. Uh, he's a little younger than you, isn't he? Put the whooping on you. Yeah, he's quite daddy. a bit younger than me, actually. Well, I would kill to hear Vince's side of the Wendy Spider Lady screw job. This person said, <laughs> "Well, you probably will." Although I don't know, because like, here's a problem. It's a Vince McMahon. Think about this: when Bret Hart originally went to write his bio, uh, it was it was literally like fifteen hundred pages. And they had to edit it down to make it a, a readable book. And, uh, you know, that's Bret Hart. And, you know. I bet you Bret remembers things differently and in no, a different way. No, I'm sure he does. Vince but McMahon. my point is <laughs> if you think about all of the stories that Vince would have to tell to cover his entire career in wrestling, you know, and obviously from, from childhood as well, and then everything that he's done, like. Through to today. Brett's Brett's book was like his career through what? Uh, you know, 2001 or whatever? Something like that. I mean, this is, you got to do Vince McMahon from, you know, 1945 uh, or whatever. To at least Through 2022. 82. Yeah. What do you mean through 82? Well, hold on. Through but I mean, 2022. As as like, but as far as like chapters in there, it's like at the at the very least, that's what you can mush together there. And then he's had multiple lives basically since. It would be very, very difficult. And that's why, you know, a, a story about Mula is not as big as him noting Wendy Richter leaving and how he built stuff behind her, if he's even going to talk about something like that. So I guess it's possible. But, yeah, I think if people are looking for minutia, and and great insight. I don't know if you're going to see it there. I think if we are going to see anything that would benefit all of us, it's to really hear him because he's only done one Playboy interview about it. I think in in any depth about what his upbringing was really like and what developed this man to make this man tick in the way that he has. This person here says Impact Wrestling recently posted the full match of the reverse battle royal on their YouTube channel. I watched it. It was terrible. It just didn't make sense. Yep. Well, the the rules were you had to fight to get into and, the ring. And Brian, they did that. Remember the WWA, which started before TNA? It was the guy in Australia. He did that match. It had already failed once and was terrible once. Back in a moment, everybody. Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Very happy today to be joined by Carrie Morton of the hey, NWA yeah. and so much more. Carrie, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing, doing great. great. I'm, I'm uh, excited. excited. You know, you can do do tomorrow for NWA NWA always, always ready. ready. And, uh, right. I'm ready to go. I'm on the road right now. I, I just got home. As you can see in my guest studio in the guest room, yes, and then uh, behind me, and then I, you know, I got a wrestling show tonight here in Johnson City, Tennessee, and then uh, getting ready for Always Ready. Carrie, are you aware that your father once beat my ass in the ring? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not aware of this. Yes, one. yes. Not only that, not only that, he beat me and Filthy Tom Lawler, former UFC middleweight contender. Mm-hmm. No, Joe, what's the backstory behind this? Uh, we well, time. I got to hear this. We, uh, me and Tom were a team, and uh, I, I uh, had a promoter, a longtime friend of mine, and he said, uh, you know, would you guys be interested in working the Rock and Roll Express? And I was like, yes, of course. And so they, uh, they put the, mat the match together, and uh, it was me and Filthy Tom against uh, the Rock and Roll Express. And uh, and they they beat me. <laughs> That's great. I gotta find some video footage of this. I'd love to watch that. Oh, sometime. I'll get it to you. It's out Please. there. Yeah, Robert Gibson couldn't even like do a drop kick. They still beat us. 
And then, <laughs> then did Robert give you a side leg? That we're time? we're going over the match and right there. Yeah, we're going awesome. over this match and Robert's like, ah, I can't do the drop kick, brother, my knee. And I was like, all right, yeah, don't worry about it or whatever. And then we do the whole match. And then, like, you know, three weeks later, he's got a match with some other team, and he's out there drop kicking people. <laughs> so he had to rest it. Like, come on. Oh, Robert. Jeez, oh. that's funny. That's funny to hear, honestly. I can't wait to watch it. And I got another story for you about that match. So your father, you know, he, he didn't know a lot about Filthy Tom, but he knew that he was a, a former uh, UFC fighter. Yeah. And uh, all, all as we're setting this match up and everything like that, he's – you know, he's he's just talking about how, you know, it's uh, you know, you don't have to grab me very hard. You don't have to hit me. You know, it's fake and everything like that. And uh, you could tell like he was a little not sure about this old filthy Tom fella. Yeah. And then uh, finally, finally, he just goes, "Come here, brother. Let's lock up." <laughs> and they lock up. And just to test out the water. And, and as soon the as they locked <laughs> up, as soon as they locked up, your dad goes, "All right, everything's cool." And he was fine <laughs> after that. <laughs> That sounds like the most dad thing that I know that he would do. Like, all right, everything's cool now. Yeah, everything was cool now, yeah. Yeah. I I'd like to in storyline here make fun of your father, but he was just the sweetest guy. He was awesome. And I was That's so awesome. happy he to talks be about you uh, often. Now, that, now he's like you know what's crazy it is? He's better at social media than I am, and I, I'm 21 years of age, and I should be at my peak on social media. And he is—he knows more than I know what's going on in the wrestling world right now. He's like, oh, yeah, I know. Brian like, just reported a crazy story, and uh, he was talking about something Dave Meltzer just said, and then he was talking about something Sean Ross put over. I was like, what the heck, Dad? You know this stuff better than I do. So he, he keeps up to date with everything that you guys are doing. Aren't you supposed to sort of be a social media guy? So— <laughs> Kind of in a way, but uh, you know, my, that's my major in college is I'm actually yes. a social media manager, uh, a marketing manager. But my time's not really devoted on social media a lot. I try, I'm trying new habits, I'm trying new things. I uh, I just did some film work just recently again. Uh, I, I did professional theater, and now I got into some film work. Uh, I'm not a lot of time on social media, honestly. As much as I would kind of like to be to kind of keep up with the wrestling world and the and the grand scheme of things. You know, I want to I want to bring up the fact that uh, you mentioned many of the things that you have done and are doing, but you do not mention NCAA cheerleader. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know yeah. this or not, but uh, in my youth, I was a gymnast, and uh, you know, I had to, I had to hear from people who are like, "Ah, oh, gymnast, you're," you know, they they would make fun of the idea that I was a male gymnast. And I was, I was like, brother, you show me one iron cross, and you can talk about how ridiculous it is for a dude to be a gymnast. Guys, you know, you want to know what a male cheerleader has to do? Holy smokes. You got to be jacked. You got to hold these people up in the air with one hand. I had friends that were male cheerleaders. This is no joke. It, it, it's no game. It's no joke. My friends, I can't even explain to them exactly what all I go through in a, in a typical practice. And, you know, our practices are three and a half hours almost every day of the week. Uh, you know, we usually get Sundays off if we're fortunate, but you know, but especially when we're leading up to our national tournament and in which we won, by the way, it's a little bragging right there. I can talk about, but, um, we were training every day a week for at least three and a half hours, man. And it's just like, there's no break, you know, and it's, it's like wrestling to a whole other uh, extent. You know, you have, you have some choreography, you have some downplay, but at the end of the greens games, if you mess up, you know, there's there's no going back. So that it's I love what school it. Are you going to? I am an NCAA athlete and uh, a collegiate cheerleader. And at the, at the most, I love it though. I wouldn't change anything. What school do you go to? I go to King University. It's in uh, Bristol, Tennessee. It's a Division two university. It's a little smaller, but it's beautiful. Beautiful campus up in the mountains here in East Tennessee, and uh, you can't can't go wrong with the scenery here. Well, and, a, and a huge, incredible wrestling tradition throughout a lot of those towns and in that area of the country, which you well know. And you actually had a match last weekend in Williamson, West Virginia, where you faced off. A lot of people talk about action Mike Jackson down there in the Gulf Coast, Mr. Alabama Junior Heavyweight Champion at 72 years old. But you faced off against Chick Donovan, who's 75 years old, who's still tan, who's still jacked. It's amazing. And apparently all of his real hair. Oh, is it, that true? It, dude, what, it, it was real hair, all the glory, all the glorified. I mean, it was Chick Donovan. You know, this is a funny story I have. So I knew Chick uh, for a while, and Chick knew me, and he called me as Morton. What up, Morton? Yeah, that you refer to as Morton. Uh, and, you know, he didn't really understand kind of like, uh, you know, he doesn't keep up with the grand scheme of independent wrestling anymore. He just kind of does his own thing and leaves. But he said, I watched you on YouTube, kid. 
I said, well, thank you, Chick. I appreciate that. And he said, tonight when we go out there, they're going to boo for you and they're going to cheer for me. You got that, Morton? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got that. So I went out there and uh, believe it or not, Chick Donovan uh, had his working boots on as usual. And we tore it up. I think we we're semi semi main event and uh, went probably 20 minutes, quite frankly. And we, you know, hip tosses, arm drags, body slams, suplexes, figure four. It was all involved in this matchup. Uh, man, for 75 years of age, you would have never guessed it. The man can roll. He can go. Sounds like I need to put Chick Donovan on my list. <laughs> my kind of <laughs> match so right there. Too. He was so fun. Very old school wrestling. You know, in today's age, uh, kind of breaking the fourth wall a little. You know, in, in, in today's age, especially like when you're doing TV, you go rest up in the back. Not here. We were all, uh, everything, every single thing was called in the rink, uh, which is the art of professional wrestling. It's something I adored, and I, I gained a lot of knowledge from that match. So uh, it, was, it was very fortunate to be put in that position. So when did you know that you wanted to do wrestling? And uh, I guess tell us about, you know, getting into it and training and your father's thoughts and the whole nine yards. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think – always the the end goal was professional wrestling and i think that's what my my parents saw that early in stages as i did sports all throughout high school i did uh, amateur wrestling in one state uh, i did you know my my mom made me audition for community theater plays and then um i happened to get pretty good at that and then i, I went on to audition for professional equity theaters and and I worked with those guys for a while so i took vocal lessons i, I took dancing lessons acting lessons uh, kind of for the end goal of professional wrestling, you know, especially growing up in this business. Uh, my mom worked a full-time job. My dad worked on the weekends. And so there was no babysitter necessarily. So I went on the road with my dad every single weekend uh, for a, a few years, you know, when I was just a little boy growing up in this. And I grew up in the business, grew up around the boys and the gals. And uh, it, it was really interesting kind of you know, you, after all this time, you would think after 21 years of just professional wrestling, you'd get burnt out. But I think now I love it more than ever, um, especially, you know, I made my debut uh, right before the pandemic two years ago. And it was uh, it was I was on high waters. You know, I, the wrestling world kind of blew up. My dad announced that I was starting my professional wrestling career uh, and I had bookings like day in and day out for for like months and then the pandemic came and closed everything down. But that was a fortunate, uh, a blessing in disguise as well too, because I get to sit back. I get to watch more tapes. I get to wrestle more, uh, wrestle more locally, kind of get the, the grand scheme of things under my belt before I go back out into the wrestling world and make more of a name for myself. Gymnastics for your core strength and the discipline and the stage for your, you know, interviews and to get comfortable in front of people. Was that something that came naturally to you? Was that something that was suggested to you if came. you wanted to make it in wrestling or was it just something that you were all about anyway? Oh, I was all about it anyways, but I think it just came natural to me. Listen, I'm not afraid of the spotlight, baby. You put that spotlight right on me. That's what exactly what I want. I want the microphone. I want to speak my mind. I want to tell the world what I think. So, I wasn't afraid one bit, you know, I, I was, uh, you kind of get those butterflies in your stomach time and time again, especially when I made my professional debut out on the stage and touring with some, uh, some grand scheme of like national tours and stuff like that. But, uh, man, how it was so fun. I loved theater. I loved my journey in theater. Uh, and you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily count it as I'm done. I just got a little burnt out. You know, I, I did it all throughout high school. I didn't necessarily have much of a social life. Um, it was school, workout, uh, book, study, and then go to rehearsal or go to work, technically. You know, work is rehearsal and uh, performing. So, you know, I played sports, but I never really had much of a social, social life. So it was kind of tough to kind of digest a little. And once that ended, it was like, wow, like I have free time. What do I what do I do with myself right now? Like I picked up the hobby of playing video games because like that's how I, I, I kind of coped with like free time a little. I was like, what do I do? So... So tomorrow it is a uh, three-way. You get a team with your father against the Fixers and AJ Kazana and TBA. There's a mystery man. Is it Chick Donovan? You know what? I'm not really aware. You know, usually uh, we would hear a little something, maybe some rumors, but the rumors are kind of tossed all up in the air right now. I, I heard a, a man such as name as Adorable Anthony Andrews. Could be in there. Uh, Samuel Shaw was announced recently for pay-per-view. Hell, 
maybe Billy Corgan might show up and be a tag team partner for all I know. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen in, uh, in this kind of grand scheme of things, which is exciting, too. We don't necessarily know what to prepare for. Uh, we went down to the school of Morton this week, which is my father's wrestling school. We trained, and we, we did some cool moves together and just kind of learned the ways and learning habits to, to, to see what we're going against. We don't know what, what's going to step in that ring come uh, Saturday night. Now, I don't know if you know, or if you do know, if you could tell us, but what is the main event tomorrow? It's supposed to be Nick Aldis and Matt Cardona, but Matt Cardona's out. Do we have any so, idea what they're doing? I, I'm curious to know, too. I, I, I've heard a couple things. Now, I know Nick Aldis is uh, he's a fighting champion. He wants the NWA World Championship back. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes in this crazy business, things can turn uh, in just the matter of seconds. And, you know, Matt Cardona is a very very uh big hand at the end of the day right now being the world champion so you know you never know who might pull in there it could be mike knox it could be uh samuel shaw it could be uh some other recent releases from the the big leagues uh, another big league of some sort um you just never kind of know it, it, you know what i mean it could be it could be xbox for all i know you know it, it's kind of crazy what's going on uh so it's exciting. It's kind of exciting to know that the main event's kind of tossed up in the air right now. We don't know what we're going to get ourselves into. Well, Brian, you don't have any shows scheduled after today, right? I Hey, listen, I'm still in quarantine until tomorrow. Ah. Oh, well, no. Yeah, not sure. Not sure I can make it out, but uh, hey, what are your thoughts on the NWA? You having I fun? Abs- I'm sorry? You having fun? I'm having so much fun. I-, I love the NWA right now. And you know what the best part about it is? is Billy and the team um, allows me to be me. And I think that's something that you can never take for for granted. You know, I, I have such a, a grateful opportunity there to to work my tail off, to earn my spots, to uh, show everybody that, hey, just because I'm Ricky's boy doesn't mean I'm not my own self, too. And that's something that is time and time again I'm proving. You know, as you last saw a couple of weeks ago, I just wrestled Mike Bennett on NWA, one of the best Pound for pound wrestlers in the independent circuit. Actually, and- Kerry, hold that thought for one second. We're right at the break here. Back in a moment, talk more Observer Live. Hey, okay, the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Kerry Morton joining us here today. We got about 60 seconds as a uh, someone with a major in social media. Let's get some social media notes out. Absolutely. NWA and yourself. Man, please, uh, those who are listening, find me on Instagram. It's the real Kerry Morton. Uh, R-E-A-L, Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y, Morton, M-O-R-T-O-N. Same for Twitter, Twitter, excuse me, and same for Facebook. Go out there, find me, find where I'm going to be at upcoming shows, events, uh, getting ready for NWA. Um, you know, you never know where Kerry Morton might just show up. So uh, follow me on social media. I would love that. And, of course, the NWA is tomorrow, the pay-per-view. Always ready. Just like Kerry Morton's always ready, right? That's absolutely right. Always ready. Ready than uh, polar bears toenails on ice. That's what I'm talking about, baby. Always Excellent. ready. For Excellent. Board. That's right. Well, have fun tomorrow. Probably a dream getting a team with your father. And uh, not the first time. Hopefully not the last time, if you know what I mean. And uh, <laughs> should be a lot of fun, everybody. Maybe we'll even see you in the main event. Who knows? They need you never a... know. You never know where Kerry Ward might show up. And uh, main event, championship gold is what Kerry wants. So uh, we'll just figure out what happens. Have you ever won a title? Uh, I've won a few titles in the independent circuit, but okay. uh, I haven't won any like major, major gold, which is most definitely on the list for 2022 or leading into 2023. So I want to hold some championship gold within the National Wrestling Alliance. Hey, very quickly, what was the first belt you ever won? I, I won the KFW Heavyweight Championship in Sevierville, Tennessee. I beat Brian Pillman Jr. for it. Wow. Brian Pillman Jr., how about that? It was awesome. We tore it up. Went 31 minutes to be exact, and uh, George South was in the corner, and he absolutely oh. popped and loved the match. He was like, wow, <laughs> you kids so tore it awesome. up. That's surprising in today's age. So God, that's awesome. <laughs> it was a great compliment hearing that from George. All right, Kerry. <laughs> Listen, I want to thank you very much for doing the show today. Best of luck with everything tomorrow, and we are totally out of time, everybody. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.